this is a human being I'd like to meet. So I'm in Austin. I'm with Hal Elrod. I was like high on life. I was 20, but I was making more money than I ever imagined at that age. Shattered my elbow, severed the nerve, and I bled to death where I was literally clinically dead for six minutes. And he goes, okay, well, it looks like cancer. And for, for a second, I was like, whoa, what if I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life? I decided I can't change that. I will be the happiest, most grateful person that you've ever seen in a wheelchair. Give us a minute to reflect on this, actually. I, I just want us a, a moment of silence. This sentence, I absolutely think, is one of the most profound we've had here on Sloma, honestly. The only thing that makes sense to focus on are things that I can control, and that always starts with who I am being. I'm going to accept my reality for the rest of my life before it ever happens. Welcome back. Coming to the US, I was looking for uh, some of uh, the brightest and wisest minds here, and I got introduced to today's guest, uh, who uh, we reached out to, and we said, hey, you know, do you have the time? He was so kind, so open. He said, well, I'm in Austin, Texas. If you're in Austin, let's meet. So I'm in Austin. I'm with Hal Elrod, who uh, sent me a formal introduction, if you want. And this is the first time in my life I ever read a formal introduction that started with, first and foremost, I am a father. Uh, I am a family man. He is a loyal husband to his wife of 13 years and a dedicated father to their two children. That got me because you guys know how much I love my kids and how much I wish every man would understand that. And so I was like, all right, this is a human being I'd like to meet. And then I kept reading. Uh, I knew about Hal that he was really changing the life of millions of people, mainly through The Miracle uh, Morning, which was uh, one of 12 books that he wrote, which became super successful, more than two and a half million copies uh, sold. And a very interesting promise, which is, we can change your life just by changing your morning. This is something that probably uh, everyone listening should be very interested in. Uh, from that, he has made it his mission to, listen to this, uh, elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. More and more I got into Hal's work, and I actually think he can do what he set himself uh, as a mission. Uh, he is horrendously inspiring. He really, really practices what he preaches. He then went on to his next project, The Miracle Morning Movie, which I'm very cu curious to learn about. Uh, and, uh, and I think, above all, he is someone that is genuinely uh, living uh, true to his potential, to his mission, and inspiring others to do that. Just on top of all of this, I also learned that he like myself, uh, had a, um, two, two near-death experiences, which I know shape you in, in ways that are very, very different than those who haven't experienced it. Uh, if you have not heard my conversation with Dr. Pim van Lermel uh, about near-death experiences uh, in uh, last year, so pre please go back and listen to it. And uh, so with so much in common, I don't know if we uh, will ever be able to finish this conversation. So uh, I start by thanking you so much uh, for giving us the time so uh, generously. It, it is a pleasure. It is an absolute pleasure. Hello. And that was a fantastic introduction. Thank you. I think I ranked it in order of what I loved most about the person I'm reading about. I'm, and, and honestly, in a world where everyone is just uh, name dropping and stealing titles and bragging about their achievements or faking their achievements. Yeah. Who starts his introduction, his formal bio by, <laughs> I am a first and foremost a family man? Who does that? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, that was inspired. Um, I am a, uh, a, a member of a group called Front Row Dads. Ah. And one of my best friends founded it. Mm. And he had this realization where when someone asked him, what do you do? Mm. You know, right? Uh, I'm an author. It was, how can I impress with this? It's just like, just like you said. Yeah. Uh, I'm an author. Um, I, I give speeches all over the world, you know. Mm. And uh, and then, oh, yeah, and I have a wife and kids and we live here. Right? And that's how yeah. most bios That's if go. they remember. Most people don't even mention exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And he said, and I realized that um, 
my identity, he said, is tied up in my work. And he said, that's not the most important role I'm here to play. Interesting. Uh, it's for these children. It's for my wife. It's for my family. And so he had this shift where he said, I have kind of identified as I'm a businessman or I'm an entrepreneur with a family. Mm. And he decided in that moment to switch it and go, no, I'm a family man with a business. <laughs> and, and then he decided, you know, how can I align both? He created this front row dads community. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, he, that, that's really, he's been the inspiration for me to really make that shift and go, yeah, my kids aren't going to remember how many books I sold or how many speeches I gave, or how many mortgage payments I made, or how much, <laughs> right? Mm. No, they're gonna remember how much time did you spend with me? How much love did you give me? How much How much of yourself did you invest in our family? Mm. You know, that's what they're gonna remember, and that's what matters. You know, when you're, I, I believe, when you're on your deathbed, you're gonna look back and you're gonna go, you know. I know that for certain. I, I have my priorities uh, in order. You absolutely, know? And, yeah. yeah. So for a long time, I definitely gave the bio that was, ooh, what could impress these people? What sounds cool? And, and you even embellish it a little, inflate it a little, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Do you believe that when your bio is thought of this way, written this way, your actions actually reflect that too? So if, if you define yourself as, uh, you know, I am a professional, then yeah. the first thing that takes your priority in life is being a professional. Totally. And, and, so, and so, I mean, I actually think uh, it, this is a, an invitation for everyone listening to re actually reconsider this, man or woman, f father or mother, uh, or whatever it is, you know, if you're a dancer and a banker at the same time, which one do you want to define yourself with? Because if you introduce yourself to others this way, then you're introducing your yourself to yourself yeah. that way, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, you're reinforcing that identity. Yeah. Um, you know, something else that I do, for example, is in the morning, uh, during my miracle morning, yeah. before I'm allowed, before I allow myself to read a business book, uh, I have a self-imposed rule that I have to read a book on family first. Interesting. And even just five pages uh -huh. out of a book on marriage or a mm -hmm. book on parenting. Mm -hmm. And and what that does, it's just it's these consistent reminders of, oh yeah, family's first. That's so I can cool. get I can get to business after I've invested in being a better father and being a better husband. So so from the bio to my affirmations to the books I read really and to the way I set my schedule every day. You know, I've got family time from seven to eight AM. So I wake my kids up with a foot massage. That's, I figure oh, that's a nice- Oh, luckiest how, kids alive. Yeah, I don't even, I don't walk in and go, guys, come on, get ready for school. I walk in and I, I sleep, sneak in, I reach under the covers and I just start massaging their feet. Aww. Um, and uh, I don't say anything, you know, for it, right? And then they just, and you just see them kind of, and then they know, oh, dad's here, you know? Oh, that's so and, cool. Uh, yeah. Have, have you always been like that? No, no, mm -hmm. no. So I was, I was a workaholic, you know, mm. um, and uh, and I would justify, like most entrepreneurs, right, the lie we tell ourselves is, I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for the family, right? And then there's this conflict often, at least there was for me with my wife, where she's, uh, you know, always upset because she doesn't feel like I'm not giving her time, I'm not giving the family time. I'm, oh, sweetie, I got, but I got a book deadline. Like, I got to work Saturday. Mm. You know, this was always happening and it, flying around, traveling, all of this and, and telling myself I'm doing it for them. Um, and it goes back to that. They're not going to remember how many speeches and all of this. Mm -hmm. And so I was a workaholic and then I got cancer. Did and you? Yeah, five, a little over five years ago, mm -hmm. um, I was diagnosed with a really rare aggressive form of cancer called acute lymphoblastic leukemia, mm -hmm. which it's a 20 to 30% survival rate. Wow. So I was 37 years old and doctors were saying, you know, basically there's a 70 to 80% chance that I was going to die in the next few months. You know, and, and my daughter was seven, my son was four, right? So as a dad, imagining that, oh my God, I'm going to leave them without a dad at this young age, you know? And, um, and during that cancer journey, I had a lot of time, you know, to think uh, about my priorities. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when I, where, where I really came to grips with, I've got to, I have to readjust my priorities, my identity, mm -hmm. uh, and my, my schedule and my lifestyle to really put family first. And what does that look like? What's, you know, when I come on the other side of this cancer journey, what's my new life going to look like as not a entrepreneur, right? That, that wasn't my bio back then. Mm. My bio was Hal Elrod's a best-selling author and did, 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 did right? Um, so yeah, it was after that, that I go, I got to shift my identity, shift my priorities, shift my schedule and really put family first. Why? Why do we have to go through a mega disaster in life to change? Do you believe it's necessary? 
Not necessary. Um, no, in fact, I, and I do, I do think, um, you know, all the things that I've gone through, my car accident, the cancer, all of that. You What's know? man? Yeah, and I am kind of like, God, what, <laughs> come on, I'm good. You know, uh, like my poor parents, you know, they were there when, when I was 20, I was in that car accident and I was found dead at the scene and they had Where to- Where you? Um, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, sorry to jump ahead. No, no, uh, no, no, <laughs> wait, I'm happy you jump, jump, or jump, jump behind or wherever we're, I'm going. We'll but, go back to where um, we want to and when, when it's time, but so, this is a really Yeah, so when I was 20 years old, um, I was uh, in sales and I gave a speech at a conference and I was like high on life. I had just, I was, I was 20, but I was making more money than I ever imagined at that age. Um, I just bought my brand new Ford Mustang, uh, had my own apartment, you know, had a girlfriend in love, everything was, life was great. And driving home, I was hit head on by a drunk driver at 80 miles per hour. And I spun off the drunk driver and the car behind me crashed into my driver's side door at 70 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And completely, I broke, I mean, I broke my femur in half. I broke my pelvis in three places. I broke my arm in half, shattered my elbow, severed the nerve, and I bled to death. That was the first near-death experience where I was literally clinically dead. My heart stopped beating. I didn't have a heartbeat uh, for six minutes when they pulled me out of the car. And uh, I was in a coma for six days. When I came out of the coma, uh, I was told I would never walk again and I have permanent brain damage. Mm. And I always joke, my, my, my family will vouch for the brain damage, um, <laughs> for sure. It shows up in lots of fun ways. Uh, I don't have much of a filter. It's kind of like I, I've always had a few beers uh, that'll probably come out today. Um, and so sometimes I say things that my wife's like, cringing you know sweetheart that's not appropriate <laughs> um and then uh, and then my short-term memory is not not the best but uh but so i came out of the coma and i had to you know face this unimaginable reality right i'm like you know wait so i'm i'm never gonna walk again right so okay well okay what's the what the rest i'm only 20 what's the rest of my life gonna look like in a wheelchair um you know i've got permanent brain damage okay uh, all these broken bones. I've got, you know, I mean, I've got, I mean, the scarring on my body, on this whole side of my body is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as a vain 20 year old, right? I'm like, oh my God, this is, you know, what, what is, the, what's my life going to be like? And I had learned something in my uh, sales training, which was for Cutco cutlery. I don't know if you've heard of Cutco before. Mm -mm. Okay. So Cutco makes, it's made in America, the world's finest kitchen cutlery. Uh -huh. And it was sold in home presentations. Mm. And so when I was 19, I gave up my dream job of being a radio DJ uh, I was on 97.1 FM to sell Cutco Cutlery. Mm. And, um, and so I had learned something in my sales training called the five minute rule. Mm. And our manager, my mentor, Jesse said, it's okay to be negative when something goes wrong, but not for more than five minutes. That's such a great there's, rule. Yeah, there's no value in dwelling on something you can't change. And it's very Buddhist. It's very, right? It's very, it's, it's the, it's acceptance. It's very Eckhart Tolle, power of now. Mm. Um, but, but in a really simple, actionable way. And he would say, literally, he said, sales is a microcosm for life. <laughs> I he agree said, with that. Yeah. In life, everybody faces rejection, but not every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Everybody faces failure, but not every day. Mm. Welcome to the world of sales. You're going to fail every day. You're going to be rejected every day. You're going to be on track for the biggest week of your career. And, you know, your biggest order is going to cancel, you know, all these things. And he said, you need this tool where when something goes wrong, set your timer for five minutes on your phone. And by the way, for anybody listening or watching to this day, this is one of the most valuable strategies I've ever mm. implemented. Set your timer for five minutes. Give yourself five minutes to bitch, moan, complain, <laughs> cry. Go for it. Yeah, feel like, oh, how could this happen? No, be like, be a victim for five minutes, right? Whatever. But then when the timer goes off, you say three very powerful words. Can't mm. change it. Yeah. It's an acknowledgement. I can't change what happened five minutes ago. Yeah. So there's no value in wishing it didn't happen. Yeah. In bl blaming anybody. That doesn't change doesn't it. Doesn't change anything. Yeah, right? it doesn't change anything, right? It just makes me, there's no value in resisting my reality. The only logical choice I have at that point is, can't change it, I accept it, what can I change? I could, what can I do? And so I had lived that philosophy for a year and a half. And, and, and by the way, I, I want one caveat to anybody watching this, like five minutes is not long enough to be upset. You, that was what I, I was thinking in my mind it's too long too long okay well, well so you're because that's because you're like more if, if you're if you're gonna move behind it why even suffer for five minutes okay so i'm gonna one. i'm gonna share a quick story that closes the gap between those two mindsets yeah so my first mindset was like i, I need more than five minutes to be upset when something goes wrong mm -hmm. and so the first i remember the first time i had a woman cancel an appointment and i was really looking forward to it 
set the timer for five minutes and was, you know, ah, oh, no, I'm pacing around my apartment. And the timer goes off and I go, I'm still pissed. Like, <laughs> exactly. This, just because the timer went off, that doesn't change that I'm upset. So I, I snoozed or, you know, five more minutes, right? And I did that a few times. But here's what happened. My consciousness was elevated to an awareness that, okay, every painful emotion is self-created by our resistance to our reality. Mm. It is our wishing and wanting that something were different that cannot be different, that causes emotional pain. Correct. And so I remember it was, I'm not, maybe, maybe a week into this strategy, maybe less, um, I remember a woman canceled. It was the end of the week, and I, I had, you know, it was like I had just hit my goal for the week, and she canceled the biggest order for the week, and I had no time to make up for it. I had to turn in orders the next morning at 8 a.m. And I remember going, no, oh, this can't happen. What am I going to do? And instantly I thought of what am I going to do? Mm. Well, the only thing I can do is I can get on the phone and schedule more appointments and, and you know, put this behind me, make this a good week. And I picked up my phone, and there were four minutes and 32 seconds left. <laughs> and I started to set it down, and then I went, wait a minute. What's the, what's the value in stewing over this for another four and a half there minutes you go. Yeah. when I could accept it right now? Yeah. And I turned off my phone. I took a deep breath. You know, can't change it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I was like, wow, I'm completely in control of my inner world. Yeah. I can completely let go of that resistance that causes emotional pain. And, and to your point, the five-minute rule in that moment, I decided it was now the five-second rule. Yeah. I, all I need to, I'm going to drop an F-bomb, you know, I'm going to oh, release the new tension that's in there instantaneously and move on. And then I want to share with you the last phase of this is accepting life before it happens. Mm. So for me, it started with the five-minute rule, became the five-second rule. And then it became an awareness that, oh, since all emotional pain is self-created by resisting reality, I'm going to accept my reality for the rest of my life before it ever happens. Man. And when I was diagnosed with cancer, which was 17 years after the car accident, and the doctor, you know, he was, he was having trouble telling me because he was afraid of how I was going to respond. And I leaned in. I said, Doc, I said, I, before he even it's told fun. me what it was, I said, I just want you to know I accept life before it happens. No matter what you're, you could literally tell me I'm dying right now. And in my mind, I didn't think it was going there. Um, I said, you can tell me I'm dying and I'm at peace with it. And he goes, okay, well, it looks like cancer. And for, for a second, I was like, whoa, <laughs> no, you know, no, give no, no. no I'm, give me my five yeah, seconds. Yeah, I need my five <laughs> seconds. I'm, hel I'm a healthy person. What are you talking about? And, um, but, but I immediately was at peace and I decided that when I had my car accident, and I came out of the coma and I was thinking, okay, what if I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life? I decided I can't change that mm. if that is the case. So I will be the happiest, most grateful person that you've ever seen in a wheelchair because I'm in a wheelchair either way. You're the man, honestly. Thank this you. is it. Yeah, no, this is it, right? This is and, it. And, what, and when the thing about this is, a lot of these are these philosophies that have been around for centuries. But for me, my superpowers, I'm like, how can I experience these and teach these? Like, I don't, I'm not the most intellectual person, I feel like. So I'm like, how can I simplify these so that you could even teach it to a child? Yeah. The five minute rule, you could teach that to a kid. Yeah. You know? And so um, I decided I'll be the happiest, most grateful person you've ever seen in a wheelchair because I'm in a wheelchair either way. And for anybody listening or watching right now, what's your wheelchair? Mm. What's the circumstance in your life, past, present, or that you're worried about in the future, that is out of your control, but you allow to cause you emotional pain? Mm. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. You can choose to be the happiest, most grateful you've ever been while you're in you endure the most difficult time in your life. And when I was diagnosed with cancer, I had that reference point. I went, okay, I got a rough road ahead of me, but I am choosing to be the happiest, most grateful I've ever been in my life while I endure the most difficult time in my life. And it was, but I was at peace with even the pain. I was at peace with all of it. Um, and just like the accident, I took my, you know, the doctors didn't understand. Three weeks after the crash, they came in with x-rays and they go, your body is healing. We don't understand how quickly it's healing. And I had been visualizing walking every day. See, I accepted the worst case scenario and made peace with it but I didn't live there. I didn't live in the fear of that. I went, okay, worst case scenario, I'm happy and grateful and I chill in a wheelchair all day. Awesome. 
<laughs> what do I want? What's my ideal? I want to walk again. I want to run, mm. right? In fact, I want to run a marathon someday. Um, and so I visualized walking every day. I, vi- I meditated on my cells, healing my broken bones. I got in a state of certainty, unwavering faith that I will walk again. If I don't, I'm at peace with it, mm. right? And I think that's really hard for people that the more we're invested in something we want, the more we set ourselves up for disappointment if we don't get it. Yeah. So it's that balance between, I want this, I want this so bad, I, you know, but if I don't get it, yeah, I'm detached. totally at peace. Yeah. I'm totally detached, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that worked for, you know, walking again, defying the odds, mm-hmm. defying the odds with cancer and, you know, being in that 20 to 30% that, that beat the cancer. Because um, again, I accept it. If, I'm, if it's my time to go, <clears throat> I'm at peace with that. But that's not what I want, so. Give us a minute to reflect on this, actually. Mm. I, I just want us a, a moment of silence. This sentence, I accept my life before it happens, I absolutely think is one of the most profound we've had here on Slomo, honestly. Think mm. about it in silence for a second. So, Hal, when you talk about, I visualized myself walking again, do you believe that stuff works? Yeah, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you my layman's explanation mm. uh, of self-healing. Mm. Um, the, so when I was diagnosed with cancer, I, uh, I had watched a documentary a decade before called <clears throat> Healing Cancer from the Inside Out. Mm. And it was a two DVD set, and the first DVD talked about the flaws of our medical system, yes. of the cancer industry, yep. of chemotherapy, right? Yep. And the second DVD was all about healing yourself naturally and what the body is designed to do and, uh, and, and case studies of countless people that have healed themselves. So I went, oh, this is so empowering. If I ever get cancer, I won't do chemo. I will just heal myself naturally. <laughs> mm. And so when I went in and um, in my, we're in front of the oncologist, at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and my wife's holding my hand underneath, and he's telling me that you know the odds of beating this are only twenty to thirty percent, um, and you need to start chemotherapy immediately. And, and and by the way, at that time, the reason I went into the hospital, my lung was collapsed and I couldn't breathe, my kidneys were failing, and my heart was on the verge of failing. So my organs were all failing based on this cancer. And the doctor said, if you don't start chemo, you have um, maybe a week or a few weeks to live. And my wife is breaking my fingers underneath the table. And I'm feeling a little bit of anger toward, I'm like, how dare you, you know, like, it's you not know. your choice. Yeah, are you trying to threaten or scare me into doing yeah. this? You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, I didn't know the, per- the man, I just met him. And I said, well, can we have 24 hours to research this? Oh, because I told him, I said, I would like to cure this naturally. I don't want to do chemotherapy. I want to build my body up and harness its own ability to heal itself. And he said, Hal, you, I appreciate that you want to do that. You don't have that luxury. Hmm. He said, you have, again, you have, you have a few weeks to live. And he said, if you don't start chemo in the next 24 hours, that's it. And so I said, well, can I have 24 hours to go think about it? And he said, yes, let's decide tomorrow. And I went home. Uh, I researched. I found some of the best holistic doctors, oncologists in the world. Uh, Dr. Brzezinski was one of them. I called him. Both of the doctors said, your cancer is so aggressive and so fast acting that even though we cure lots of cancers naturally, we have no one in the world has success doing that with yours because you really do have a few weeks to live. Mm. Um, You don't have time to try and see what works if you change your diet or you do this or that. And so I thought, okay, if the best holistic doctors in the country um, don't have any recommendation, I'm not gonna go rogue and go, ah, you know, I, I know better than them. So I decided to do chemotherapy. Um, but I also decided to do everything in my power holistically as if that was the only thing I was doing. So I wasn't go, and that to me is the message, by the way, not too much of a tangent, but for people that, um, you know, that I'm almost everyone's touched by cancer or their family has cancer, somebody, um, don't put your health in the hands of the doctor. I think that's what people do is they go, okay, I'm just going to trust this person with my life right? That, that person is managing hundreds of patients, right? You're, you're only one mm. for you. And, um, and so for me, it was realizing that I'm taking 100% responsibility for my recovery and for yeah. my health. Yeah. And therefore I'm doing everything in my power. And my doctor knew literally nothing mm. about diet, nothing about any alternative protocols because yeah. that's not what he learned in school. Yeah. So I had to go on my own and buy books and do research and so on and so forth. 
Um, but, you know, I did three coffee enemas a week to detoxify my liver from the chemotherapy. I took 70 supplements every single day. I did ozone sauna. I did lymphatic massage. I did my miracle morning every day that was completely fine-tuned toward beating cancer. My visualization was beating cancer. My affirmations were around beating cancer. My meditation was around healing my body. Um, the books I was reading were all about, you know, healing from cancer. Um, and then once again, right, with that just total mindset, and I'm going to get to the, I'm going to answer your question here at the end. But once again, the doctors were blown away that I, how fast I was responding and healing. And here was my decision. The odds are 20 to 30 percent of those that get this cancer survive. Mm. And what I think that does for most people is put them in a fear state. They go, okay, so there's an 80% chance that I'm gonna die, and they literally start dying, right? I mean, they, mm. they start, they live in that fear of death, and they manifest it, it becomes their reality, and I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, for me, I, I told my wife, she was, you know, when I was diagnosed, she was a mess, she was crying, yeah. and I said, sweetheart, I said, I know this is hard, but I want, I'm, I'm telling you something. There's a 20 to 30% survival rate, that's what she was afraid of. Yeah, I said, that's amazing. I'm news. telling you, there's a 100% chance for me that I will be in the 20 to 30% of those that survive <laughs> it. So that's those amazing. are my odds are 100% that I'll be in the 20 to 30%. Yeah, because I'm not going to live in fear because I'm and here's this is my answer to your question. Does that stuff work? In terms of self healing, this is my belief from experience those both experiences walking again, when the doctor said I never would, and beating cancer when the odds were that I wouldn't that our body has trillions of cells and they do our bidding. Mm. They are impartial. Mm. If you tell them through fear, I'm going to die, I'm not going to live, then they go, okay, sure. we'll start shutting down. Yeah. But if you tell them through unwavering faith, hey, we're going to beat this, we're going to live, there is no other option, let's get to work. Mm. And you feel it with every fiber of your being. And in the beginning, you might gotta fake it till you you make it. I had moments of fear where I went, of course, what if I do everything right and I still die? You know, Wayne Dyer got leukemia and died. He was pretty damn evolved. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't know that I would say I'm, I'm, I'm beyond where he was. But yeah, but that, that's, my, that's my mindset is that our, our body's a miraculous organism. Whether you look at it from a physical standpoint, a spiritual standpoint, or a blend of the two. And again, that's my, my answer to that is that we have trillions of cells and they do whatever we tell them to. They are our army. So, you know, if you're a leader and you're, you know, and you're telling your troops, like, it's not looking good. <laughs> I don't think we're going to make it. Right. And they're like, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah but exactly. But you've yeah. got to be a leader, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to be the leader of your own body and your own mind and your own spirit. And of course that applies to everything. You want to be healthy. You want to be wealthy. You want to be successful. You want to be happy. You're in control. Yeah, I, th I think it actually extends beyond ourselves. It, it extends, if you look at it from a spiritual point of view, the, you know, the oneness of everything, that every cell in, a, in the universe, every particle in the universe will confirm. Mm. You know, yeah. if, if you're the right leader, yeah. uh, electrons will shape up into a dollar sign, right? You know, it's, it's, it's really your choice. But, but I, am, I have to say, this is such an interesting, you spoke about detachment, but you have that such an interesting paradox really yeah. of can't change it oh absolutely i'm gonna change it <laughs> yeah, right yeah. It's, it's really quite interesting so what's the dividing line when is it that you say can't change that yeah and when is it that you say oh i'm gonna beat cancer it's you know 100 percent chance yes it is interesting and that you know um i once heard someone say like that there's the genius something about the genius in holding two opposing ideas um, in your mind at absolutely. once right yeah um and so it's a discernment or an awareness of what can't I change, mm. right? And if you actually ask that question, the first answer is the past, mm -hmm. right? Unless you're Marty McFly with a DeLorean, <laughs> right? you, you can't go back in time and change the past. Mm. Yet, how many of us are suffering over the past? In uh, fact, absolutely. usually when you're upset, it's over the past. Mm -hmm. You know, it's over something just happened. Yeah. You can't go change it, right? Your spouse did this or said this or this happened, right? And now you're upset, but you can't change it. Or my favorite example is being in traffic. It's my favorite microcosm <laughs> yeah. for life. Imagine if, you, you know, most people in traffic, let's say you, you, you woke up late, right? Now you're already, you start frustrated. Now the alarm didn't go off. I got to be somewhere, you know? And then, and then you, you, you're going, oh, I'm not going to make it. And then you hit bumper to bumper traffic. And you go, no, not today. Mm -hmm. Like it's the traffic's fault that you left exactly. late or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Not today. Of all days, not today. And you spend every moment in that car, in that unchangeable traffic, 
frustrated, yeah. and tense, yeah. and stressed, and replaying the past and how your alarm didn't go off, and your and then and then projecting into the future over the the person I'm supposed to meet is going to be upset, and all these things that are out of your control. How intelligent is that, honestly? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Right. How into, well, But the thing is, it's just a lack of aware. Right. It's lack of awareness. We don't know there's a different way. Mm -hmm. We just that's the only way. We don't know there's another way. Yeah. Our, our, my dad got mad in traffic, so that's what I learned. And yeah, and every Hollywood movie when someone got stuck in traffic, they yeah, you they're know, frustrated. Yeah. And so, but I love this because the cab of that car is like a metaphor for your mind, mm -hmm. meaning that you're in that cab. What's the experience going to be like that you're going to choose? Mm. It could be the most, you're in traffic, can't Absolutely. change that, can't change it, can't change it. What can I change? The first thing is always what I think, what I focus on, what I feel, and, and my experience of life. And so in that car, when I'm in traffic, I used to get upset. Actually, I had made wristbands that said can't change it. I used to have a wristband to remind me of that. And I'd be in traffic and go, son of a, no, not today. And then I would see that, can't change it. Oh yeah, I can't change that I'm in traffic. I can't change that I left late. I can't change that there are cars going slower than I want them to. What can I change? I can change how I experience this ride. Yeah. And I'm gonna be the most grateful I've ever been while I go through, I'm gonna be at peace. I'm gonna turn the radio, I'm gonna laugh, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna, and to me, that's life. Mm. That, that car ride, that's life. You can't change other people and what they're doing. You can't change what happened in the past, but in this moment and in every moment, you can choose to have the most beautiful experience, even if the world is chaotic around you. And right now, it sure as hell is chaotic around us. Yeah. Even the Bible said the kingdom of heaven is within, right? Mm -hmm. That inner freedom to experience life how you want. And then from that place, there's still problems and challenges, but you're, A, you're enjoying this one life you've been blessed to live, right? Mm -hmm. You're not allowing your circumstances to determine your inner world, your quality of life, which most pe most of us do, Yeah, we've been conditioned to think bad things happen and I feel bad. When good things happen, I feel good. And what I'm offering is a new paradigm, which is how about no matter what happens, I feel you good. choose how you feel, which is yeah. gonna be good. I mean, I don't know anybody that doesn't wanna feel good, <laughs> yeah. right? So, yeah. Take me back to that near-death experience for a minute, mm. uh, because it's a topic that's really important for me. What was that experience? Can you tell us how you felt? What happened? What did you have? I don't remember. Nothing. In a head-on collision, your frontal lobe, which interestingly enough, since I was hit by a drunk driver, your frontal lobe is the part of your brain that goes to sleep when you drink alcohol. Uh -huh. Okay. And if you look at what are the impacts of that? Well, your short-term memory is compromised and your inhibitions, right? You, you say things that are just, <laughs> there's no filter. Yeah. And that's why to this day, I have a limited filter. But when I was in the hospital, I had like no filter. I would say anything that I thought, <laughs> which was, I mean, my, and I had this, I had this really attractive nurse. You can only imagine the <laughs> things I would say to her and flirt with her. And anyway, so in a front, in a head on collision, right? When the, your frontal lobe is just smashed. So I have no memory. My first, my last memory was getting on the freeway that night. Mm. And then my first memory is about two weeks after the accident, when I'm in the hospital, my dad comes in and tells me he believes the doctor, the doctors think I'm in denial because I'm so happy. <laughs> they thought I was either delusional or in denial because I was always smiling and laughing and joking. And it's funny, their diagnosis was that I couldn't accept my reality, mm. so I checked out. Yeah. And they had it backwards. It was, yeah. no, I've completely accepted my reality, so I've chosen, now I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna enjoy yeah. this recovery, right? Mm. Um, but as far as the near-death experience, I don't remember it at all, but, there is, there is this eternal knowing, if that makes sense, right? Like I have no intellectual recognition, but I have a deep sense in my soul, in my spirit, that it really did happen for a reason, yeah. that it's part of my evolution, mm. and that I now have been given the responsibility of dedicating my life to using my life experiences to serve humanity in whatever way I can. And isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it's the best yeah. thing you can ever do. And I think it's, I think for all of us, we can, yeah. you know. Yeah, Espe especially as, as you said a, a couple of minutes ago at the current times. I mean, I was chatting with a friend yesterday um, when the 2008 crisis happened. Um, I was at Google at the time, and okay. and I used to be always a little old for Google, if you don't, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so my, my my actually this actually is a true story. When I when I was introduced to that leadership team, that when I joined, 
my boss literally i walk into the room they're chatting in the morning before the meeting and he's, he goes he goes like guys guys this is mo he's bringing the average age of the company up <laughs> I'm like awesome. that's it. That's it. like <laughs> that's and he, my did, intro. He, he didn't say anything more. Basically, that's it, uh, right? How about he's bringing wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when when the 2008 uh, um, um, you know crisis, economic crisis happened, it was literally only me and Eric Schmidt, who was our CEO at the time, who were like, yeah, we've seen this before. Yeah. You know, it's like we know that stuff. It's just a cycle. Yeah. But I was chatting to a friend yesterday that it, this one is actually different. We haven't seen this level of change before. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, I don't say that to scare people. I, I say that because I think it requires, um, and accordingly, it requires a different approach, a different level of wisdom yeah. to deal with this current uh, situation. And like you taught me, I'm going to be the happiest person in the world going yeah. through this coming challenge, yeah. right? What is your advice to people around that? Yeah. When 2020 hit, um, well, or real quickly. So in 2008, when the economy crashed, I crashed with it. Uh -huh. And I was that eternal optimist where it, from that experience, I came up with my own quote, which is, um, there's a fine line between optimism and delusion, right? <laughs> yeah. And there really is, you yeah, know, it's it like, yeah. if you just think a lot of times, I think as an optimist, it's a defense mechanism, Yeah. right? So it's like, I don't like feeling pain. That was for me. Um, and it was like, so I just focus on the positive and then I feel good all the time. Well, great. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so there's that fine line between realism and, you know, optimism, mm. delusion and realism and, and finding the, the right balance. Mm. So in 2008, when the economy crashed, I lost over half of my income. I, I couldn't pay. I just bought my first house a year before, lost it. Bank took it back. Uh, I got really depressed. I stopped exercising. My body fat percentage tripled. It was like this six month downward spiral. And that's where the Miracle Morning was born from. Mm. And I'm sharing this because it applies to, to now. Um, but the Miracle Morning, the, the philosophy was from Jim Rohn. Mm. He said, your level of success in any area of life will seldom exceed your level of personal development. Mm. And the way that I quantified that is I went, okay, on a level, on a scale of one to 10, if you're measuring success in terms of your health, your finances, your relationship, you name it, I think every human being wants level 10 success. Yeah, I right? think they aspire to. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's this innate drive and desire that we want to be the best that we can be. We want life to be as good as it can be, right? And then I went, okay, if my level of success will seldom exceed my level of personal development, and again, this is 2008 where I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drowning in debt. I'm, you know, I'm just like, I'm a mess. Um, I'm not exercising at the time. And I went, okay, I want level 10 success, but my level of personal growth and development's like at a two, <laughs> like maybe a three or four in a good day, right? And I believe this is the disconnect for society. Mm. It's everybody wants this, but we have not been taught that, well, who are you becoming? Mm. I think that's the secret of success is not doing more as much as it is becoming more. Can no, you no, hold on, hold on. That, that you can't just drop this. <laughs> I can't just drop this. You cannot just drop this. <laughs> because I, I, this is a, a very, very big mm. paradox in our world today. We live in a world that's hyper masculine, if you want, mm. in the way that we want to do, 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 do. We rarely ever want to be, be. become, right? Mm. And, and the example I, I give to people that makes a very big difference is that you can change the world by being kind. You don't do anything, just being kind or being compassionate or being empathetic or feeling the feelings of another. Yeah. You haven't done anything, yeah. right? Yeah. And and so so there is there is a huge thing about becoming, right? That we don't even talk about at all. Yeah. Yeah. The well there's there the paradigm of uh I don't want to butcher this, but uh be do have. Yeah. Right? It's the it's that they people have it backwards. Most of us think, well once I have more mm. more time. Mm. more money, right? More resources. Once I have more, then I can do, do the thing. Then I can do more. Yeah. And then if I do more, then I can be happy. Yeah. I can do the things that, right? And it's the, it's, you, you have to flip it around. Instead of have, do, be, mm -hmm. it's be, do, have, which is you flip yeah. it around. You go, no, it's about becoming the person mm. that is qualified, capable, ready to, to, to do the things Mm. So you can have the life that you really want, right? Mm. It's 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 being happy so that you can do the things that a happy person would do so you can have the things a happy person, right? So it's flipping it around. And when I heard that Jim Rohn quote, I realized I need to up my personal development. Mm. I And actually the epiphany was I'm going to go home. I was on a run when I heard this. And I thought I'm going to go home and I'm going to create the most extraordinary 
effective personal development ritual in the history of humanity. Uh, I'm going to go big. I'm going to try to figure out. I'm just basically going to figure out what did the, I'm going to go study. What are the world's most successful people do for their personal development? Mm. And I'm going to assemble the best ritual, like the best of the best. Mm. And I was thinking like it'd be, you know, one or two practices. And I went home and I just started Googling. You know, I was, what, 28 at the time. You know, again, I'm in debt. I'm depressed. I'm a mess. My house is up for foreclosure, right? We're getting ready to move back in at home with my dad. Uh, and my wife's pregnant, by the way, at the time. You know, I mean, like it was just not, not in a good spot. And I went home and just Googled, what are the world's most successful people do for their personal development? And I came up with, I was looking for one or two. I had a list of six practices after about a half an hour. I had meditation affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and journaling. I almost dismissed it all because none of those are new. And we're conditioned in our society to look for new. Mm. If I've heard of it, it obviously doesn't work because otherwise I'd be where I want to be. So Interesting. I need the new thing. Yeah. I need the new strategy. Yeah. And not to mention, we're just conditioned for I want the new phone, the new app, the new this, the new that. It's all new. And these are the most timeless, age-old practices that, you know, I've read before. I've, you know, what? Um, and so I'm looking at these and I'm going, I read an article, Fortune 500 CEOs that swear by meditation. Mm. And that shifted my paradigm. Because I'm like, I thought of meditation as like a monk. Yeah. Sitting all day in his robe. Yeah. Connecting with me, you know. And not just Fortune 500 CEOs saying that that's where they get their best ideas. That's where they get their clarity, right? And I went, okay, I got to meditate. And then I saw a, an interview with Will Smith. This is way before the Chris mm. Rock slap. He was interviewed by Ellen DeGeneres. She said, Will, how are you, how'd you become so successful? And he said, I learned written affirmations when I was, I think he said, 15 years old. Mm. And he said, I basically, I wrote out affirmations that affirmed what I wanted to have in my life, what I needed to do, and who I needed to be, mm. right? So he, he understood that be, do, have. And he said, and then I read those every day and I just lived in alignment with what I was affirming. And I go, I'm, and I'm watching that, I'm going, oh man, well, I gotta do affirmations. Mm. And so as I'm looking at this list of six practices, I go, which of these is the best one? There's no clear winner. You can find somebody that says that their books they read is what led to their success. In fact, Jim Rohn's favorite practice was journaling, right? So mm. I almost threw in the towel getting overwhelmed and then the epiphany was, what if I did all of these? What if I woke up an hour earlier tomorrow, even though I was not a morning person at all, I only mm. slept till the last minute, snoozed three times, but what if I woke up tomorrow an hour earlier and I did the six most timeless, proven personal development practices in the history of humanity that the world's most successful people across all walks of life have sworn by for centuries? That would be the ultimate personal development ritual. And theoretically, that would enable me to close the gap between the level of success that I want, that level 10 success, and me becoming the level 10 version of me that's capable of achieving it. And so I woke up the next morning and I fumbled through like meditation was, I didn't know how to meditate. I had never done it at the time. It was like literally my mind's racing. I'm going, I suck at this. You know, the affirmations I found online felt phony and goofy. Um, and stumbling my way through those six practices, even not doing them excellent, right? It was, I did them poorly. At the end of that hour, I went from the day before I was depressed, I was scared, I felt hopeless. The economy, by the way, important, was continuing to decline. Yeah. And this is so important to share in this time as we are in a recession, entering a recession, that most people use that, oh, well, it's not my fault, it's yeah. out of my control. Can't change it. Can't change it, right? Yeah, yeah I can't change the economy, but again, well, it goes agree. back to, I can I change agree, myself. Can you change? The yeah. only thing you can change is yourself. Yeah. And so every day, so I started, Focusing, how can I generate business? How can I? That was my miracle morning was focused on. And I was thinking it would take a year. Mm. The compound effect, a little better every day. And Mo, in less than two months, I more than doubled my income. More than doubled my income as the economy got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. I went from being in the worst shape of my life physically where I hadn't exercised in six months to committing to run a 52-mile ultra marathon. Did you really? Mm -hmm. And I ended up, and, I, and by the way, I did that. This is, so this is interesting. I hated running. I hated and, and running. And you, you were out of an, an, an injury where people said you're never, never going to walk again. again. That was part of my inspiration. I thought, how cool would it be <laughs> if I, that was in, my ego. In my, your face, Yeah, Mr. my Doctor. ego definitely got involved there. I'm like, I'll show those doctors that I never walk again. How about I run 50? Have you run 52 miles? In a day? <laughs> and so, um, so I committed, I trained for that marathon. I, I completed it six months later. But most importantly, 
most importantly, and for anybody watching right now and listening, right, you can't snap your fingers and change your, you know, your income overnight, right? You can't change your bank account balance. There's certain things that you can't just, they're going to take time to change. Your mental and emotional state is, I believe, what we have the ability to change the fastest. Mm. And that was the powerful thing. I was so depressed and felt so hopeless going into that morning. Within two months, it didn't take two months, within a few days, I had hope again because I went, this is it. Mm. If I do this, if I start every day with this much clarity and energy and confidence and and a strategy, it's only a matter of time before I turn my life around. And so I wasn't depressed anymore. I was excited. I was energized. I was hopeful. And that happened in a matter, in a couple of days. I mean, it started that first morning. And I went to my wife after two months and I said, sweetheart, I just signed on two more coaching clients. We've doubled our income since I started doing that miracle morning. Or no, no, I'm sorry. It didn't have a name. Mm -hmm. I said, since I started doing this morning routine, I've doubled our income. I go, it feels like a freaking miracle. And she goes, it's your miracle morning. Yeah, and I go, she's my muse, by Mm -hmm. the way. And uh, I go, I like that miracle morning. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing my schedule every day, miracle morning, miracle morning. And then my coaching clients, which I now had a bunch of coaching clients again, one of them asked me, she goes, do you have a morning routine? I keep reading about morning routines. And I'm just chomping at the bit. I go, oh. Yeah, I have the miracle morning for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call it the miracle morning. Let me tell you about it. And she goes, I'm not a morning person, but I'll try it. And then two weeks later, she comes back and goes, how? I just had the best week in my sales career. I started running again. And I read a book that's been on my shelf for months. Mm. And she goes, it is literally, it's it's the miracle morning. Mm -hmm. And then I told all my coaching clients that next week. And almost all of them resisted. I'm not a morning person. And they all came back two weeks later. And all but one said, I'm a morning person now. This is it. I'm changed. Like I'm having the best this, the best that, you know? And that's when the light bulb went off. And I went, wait a minute. If this changed my life and I wasn't a morning person, it changed Katie's life and it changed all my clients' lives. And it goes back to that purpose that was born out of the car accident that it's using my experience to serve humanity. I thought I have a responsibility to share this with the world. And that's when I started writing the book and, you know, um, it was self-published. I mean, you know. Was it? it? Yeah. So that's a whole other story of how it went from an un- unknown self-published book to selling millions of copies or whatever. But, mm. um, but yeah, and, and the reason I brought all of that up is you asked what to focus on now, mm. right? And that really is an important preface because when 2020 hit, um, the world started to feel out of control, mm. right? This pandemic, this virus, this, you know, right? Fear being stoked everywhere. Um, and when we focus on that, which is out of our control, yeah, we feel out of control, right? Exactly. Very natural. Yeah. And when you focus on that, which is out of your control, and then you put yourself in a state of feeling out of control, that's what causes anxiety. Mm. That's what causes fear, depression. And since 2020, that which is out of our control has been amplified and shoved into the collective consciousness of humanity. And we're all feeling it. We're all experiencing it. And so as a leader, once that started to happen, I asked myself, okay, for me personally, what's the most important thing? What should I be focused on right now? What's the most important thing to focus on? For me, because I always go first, right? Kind of the like Tim Ferriss style guinea pig, like I'm going to try it on me, you know? (laughs) And then I realized that the only thing that makes sense to focus on are things that I can control. And that always starts with who I am being, yeah. how I am showing up every day for myself, for my family, for those I love, for those I lead. And so I just doubled down on my miracle morning. I went, okay, it is time to get really focused on how can I show up every day with, in the midst of chaos and uncertainty and, and the out of control? How can I show up with love and with courage and with clarity? How can I show up as the best version of me? Mm. The happiest, most grateful I've ever been, right? Whatever, yeah. however you want to define it. Um, and so that, I believe, is what we must do. Yeah. You know, it, it, go back to Gandhi of be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to see peace in the world, be peaceful. If you want to see kindness in the world, be kind. If you want to see, you know, if you want to see humanity not fighting with each other, right versus left, black versus white, right? Then be that source of Calm and Harmony, strength yeah. in the middle of the storm, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get mornings where you're not into it? Totally. This yeah. morning. 
Did yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning. Look at you with your energy <laughs> and without this. You know. Um, so no, this morning I, uh, I, for whatever reason, I woke up. You, you know those mornings sometimes where you wake up and your brain's just not on. Yeah. And this morning I opened my computer. I'm right now. I'm I'm uh, rewriting the Miracle Morning. I'm doing an updated and expanded edition for the ten year anniversary. Wow. And uh, and it's so funny. By the on a side note, as I go back and read the book I wrote ten years ago. It, I cringe. You know, you watch. <laughs> I know that right? for yeah. sure. When you yeah. go back and watch an old video or listen, you're like, yeah. turn it off. I can't yeah, yeah, sound yeah. this. I sound. I, I always do this. You know, <laughs> you know, the editing process of books is that you edit them, you finish them, you give them to, to print, yeah. and then you record the audio, right? Yeah. yeah. And every time I'm recording the audio, I'm like, who wrote this crap? Yeah. Like this yeah. is horrible. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, so so that's both. It's exciting because right. I can do something about it now, yeah. right? Um, like once you put the book to print, it's like kind of like can't change it. Yeah, I, I can't just go back. But now, finally, ten years later, but I'm, yeah, I'm like, oh, this is cringeworthy. This is this part is so cheesy. This is so, <laughs> you know, I'm so tone deaf here. So, so I'm rewriting it. But anyway, this morning, like, and I've got a deadline. I need to get it done by the end of this month in a couple of weeks. And um, this morning I woke up and I was like, can't do this. I, I no, started. No I tra- energy. Yeah. yeah, I spent about five minutes on it, and then I was like. It's not today. Yeah. It's not today. So and you, so I can't change what, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be at peace with it's not today. And you're kind to yourself in that I, way. And kind to of my, yeah, exactly. I yeah. Mean, again, it goes back to, I believe that for any individual, the most important thing we can adopt is inner freedom. Yeah. Right? Be to kind just, to say, you know what? It's okay today if I'm not that person. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to accept what I can't yeah, change. Yeah. I'm going to be at peace. And mm-hmm. then I'm going to ask myself, what's the optimal way for me to feel to experience life in this moment and mm. in the rest of the day. Mm. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to call you Sensei from now on. <laughs> this, okay. So Sensei, so, say them again. <laughs> the six. Uh, um, so meditation, affirmation. Oh, wait, wait. So start over. Mm. So they, so there's a, me- they're an acronym now, SAVERS. Uh-huh. S-A-V-E-R-S. And so S-A-V-E-R-S. meditation E-R-S. became silence. Uh-huh. Okay. Affirmation stayed the same. That's the A. The V mm. is for visualization. Visualization. The e is for exercise. The R is for reading, and then journaling mm. became scribing. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I will a, a quick, real quick story. I uh, I was writing the book, and one day I was super frustrated because I had these six practices, but they were so I'm like, none of these are new. And again, people want new, you know. And uh, I I went. I remember I walked out. I needed a break from my computer from writing, and I walked out into the hallway. My wife's walking into the bedroom. She goes, "What's going on? You know, you look stressed." And I said. I've got these six practices, but they're not connected. They're not cohesive. They're not memorable. And she goes, why don't you get a thesaurus and see, again, remember see, she see, named the yeah. Miracle Morning. Yeah. And then now she goes, why don't you get a thesaurus and see if you can replace some of the words and make an acronym so it's memorable. Mm. And so meditation became silence and journaling became scribing. And, and what I love about this, it almost felt like it was a God thing Sense, in terms yeah. of, yeah. I'm like, these are the lifesavers. They are savers. These are yeah. the six practices that saved me from depression, from missing out on that level 10 life that we all want. These are the six practices that will save anybody from missing out on living to their full potential. And so, yeah, so those, the savers are those six practices. Any morning where you would do one more, one, one of them more than the others. So for example, sometimes I get, I mean, the one that I actually never, ever, ever, ever miss is meditation. Yes. Uh, so so that actually on the mornings where I feel I'm not really in good shape, I meditate more. Yeah, 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 totally. Absolutely, right? Totally. It's, it's, you know, yesterday I had a, a talk here in Austin and I, you know, it's an important talk, a very important crowd. And, you know, I was talking about artificial intelligence and they can impact artificial intelligence. And so, and I am jet lagged like crazy, yeah. right? So, yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. Just yeah. all you need is 10 minutes and, and just your your brain goes like, okay, okay, I can function again, right? Yeah. And it's funny, but, I did meditate this morning, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's when you need it most, right? If you need when it most, you know. yeah. But the others, like, you know, sometimes I start reading and it's going to take my whole hour, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, is it okay to miss some of them sometimes? Yeah. The answer is that the, the, what I love at the Miracle Morning is that it is modular, mm. right? And it's completely customizable in every way, meaning... Uh, I like to meditate first. I like to start the day by connecting to my higher consciousness and just really, you know, really just connecting with like what matters most. A lot of folks will tell me that if I meditate, I fall asleep. Mm. And so they start their day, they, they, they take the E and they move it to the front and they start with exercise because they go, I got to get the blood and oxygen to the brain so that I, I, I'm awake, right? Mm. So you can customize the order. You can customize the duration, you know, so I might meditate for five minutes, but read for 20. 
Mm. You know, and then in fact, I typically will meditate for 10 and read for 20 and exercise for 10. You know, I, I play around with it. Um, and then also you can d- determine which ones you do. Yeah. So the one that I don't do every day is visualization. Interesting. It's the one I least connect with, but I use it intentionally when I have any specific thing that I that I feel like I need to get in the zone for the state. Mm. So if I'm going to give a speech, for example, mm. right, I'll spend that. five or 10 minutes in the morning visualizing myself on stage, seeing myself performing at a peak, but I'll even use it um, with my kids. Like sometimes I'll visualize on a Saturday morning, I'll visualize my kids coming in. I'll practice what I call advanced gratitude, which is where you experience, you put yourself in a state of gratitude for something that is yet to come. So I'll imagine, I'll visualize being in a state of love, gratitude, playfulness when my children enter the room. And so it's basically, it's that mental rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So that when they come in, I've already been there, right? And immediately I'm flooded with those emotions that I experienced during the visualization. Mm. I'll use it a lot if my wife and I had a conflict the night before, right? You don't seem like the kind of couple that has conflicts. (laughs) You're you're, you're like totally in love, It's your fault. Uh, no, 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 I'm kidding. No. Uh, and we have less and less, which is great. But no, but if we do ever have a conflict, um, you know, and, and I'm, you know, and you're, so anybody that ever, you're feeling those negative emotions toward your spouse, or if you're in a perpetual, like you're in one of those spirals where it's like, it's been a bad week, you know, and you're just, you're at each other. Um, I'll visualize greeting her with love and empathy. And I'll remember what I love about her and falling and like, I'll really get in a beautiful state and it's often when I'm in the opposite state, mm. naturally, right? Like mm. I'm, I'm not in that state. So I'll use visualization. And, and I will mention this. I believe that the way we've been taught visualization is really counterproductive. Mm. We were taught by a lot of well-meaning self-help gurus to visualize the end result, yeah. right? Picture yourself crossing the finish line. The biggest farce was we were taught that if you just cut out pictures of all the physical items that you want, put them on a board, they'll magically come true, right? Mm. Um, I think the value of having like a vision board or visualizing the end result, the value is that you you imagine what's possible and then you fuel your drive, your desire to make it happen. Mm. So like I, when I ran that ultra marathon, I hated running. So I'd visualize crossing the finish line and I would I would fuel, wow, that's going to, what's that going to feel like? Mm. But here's the problem. If that's all you do, which is that's pretty much all we're taught, then what ends up happening is it becomes counterproductive in that you trick your subconscious into thinking it's a foregone conclusion. You go, yeah, it's going to happen. All right, back to whatever I'm doing. No, it's like, no, 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 no. Mm. It's not going to happen unless you do the work now. Yeah. And so for me, I'll spend literally 60 seconds, maybe um, two minutes visualizing the end result so that I can create certainty of that happening and the feeling and how good it's going to feel so that my desire, I'm fueling my desire, but then I'll spend two, three, four, five times as long visualizing myself engaged today in the activity that I need to do that will produce that result down the road. Yeah. So, and, and the important part is to visualize yourself doing it today in an optimal emotional state. So an example, the running, when I was training for the marathon, I hated running. I despised running. The thought of running is something that think of anything you procrastinate on, right? The mm. thought, of, oh, I don't want to make calls. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to whatever. And so I'd visualize the finish line. I'm going, all right, it's going to happen. I'm excited. But the most important part is I'd visualize very detailed. Today. I'd visualize my cell phone sitting in front of me at that time. The alarm would be set for 7 a.m. I'd, I'd hear it go off. I'd picture myself, pick it up, turn it off. And then I'd visualize myself getting out of off the couch and walking into my bedroom closet getting dressed in my running clothes. I would see this happening. I would then visualize myself walking through my living room to the front door. I'd visualize my hand reaching out, opening the door, and then I'd visualize seeing the sidewalk. And then I would say things to myself like, this run is gonna be the best thing you can do for yourself today. You're you're gonna be stronger because of it. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. And how you do the right thing, not the easy thing. So this run is gonna change your life today. And and that was the rehearsal. And I would create this emotion of being excited to do something I didn't enjoy doing by nature, by yeah. default. And then here's the magic in that. When the alarm went off at 7 a.m., if I hadn't have done that, I would have gone, oh, I don't want to run. I would have done what we do. And I would have procrastinated. Go, oh, I can miss a day. <laughs> and one often turns into two, turns into three, turns Absolutely. into looking back 10 years and going, 
Oh. What did I, where's <laughs> yeah. time gone? Yeah. But here's the beauty of it. When the alarm went off at 7 a.m., I didn't rehearse putting the phone down and sitting there. Mm. It was automatic. Mm. I had create, I had literally created a, a right, a, my brain. A scenario. Right, a, a scenario where I just, it was like a, a zombie. I just mm. got up, walked in, got my running clothes on. And then here's the, the, the powerful part is whenever I, I would, you know, it was like, it was like it was, I was doing what I had seen, like I had predicted the future. I opened the door and here's the power. When I saw the sidewalk, I was flooded with those positive emotions and those, those phrases of, you're going to go for this run. It's going to be awesome. And then I took action. Mm. And so to me, that is the power of visualization is, yes, yeah, see the end result for whatever time you need to get excited about it. But then spend considerable time, three, four, five minutes, seeing yourself today doing the thing in the optimal emotional state so that when it's game time, when that alarm goes off, when it's time to do the thing, right? Whether it's engage with your wife in a, or your husband in a beautiful way or get on the phone and make sales calls or get on stage or, you know, go to work and, and get whatever it is, right? You've been there in your mind. And that's what professional athletes do, right? They yeah. rehearse it. Yeah. And then when it's game time, it's like, I've seen this a scenario a hundred times before. Yeah. That's incredible, Sensei, incredible. I, I wanted to ask you about the miracle equation because mm. it's different than the miracle morning in, in, in which ways? Yeah. So it's interesting. I think that if somebody were to look from the outside and they go, okay, Hal published this book, The Miracle Morning in 2012, and then he published The Miracle Equation in, I think, 2018, mm. they'd go, he's really milking this miracle <laughs> <laughs> concept, yeah. right? But it's actually so organic, yeah. ironically. So... And, and what's also interesting is the miracle equation, the book came six years later, the concept came 10 years earlier. Uh -huh. So when I was in sales at Cutco, um, I was trying to break a record. I was trying to do something that no one in the fifth year history of the company out of over a million sales reps had ever hit this sales goal. And it was a two week period trying to sell $20,000 of kitchen knives in two weeks. Mm. Um, the day before, or a couple days before this, and I was getting myself psyched up for weeks, like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, I can do this, it's possible, right? Mm. And then a few days before, uh, our manager at the time, and I'm, I'm 20, 21 years old at the time, right after the accident, about a year and a half after the accident, and um, our manager says, uh, hey guys, I just got word, you, we don't get the full two weeks for this, this sales period, this contest, we only get 10 days. They moved the conference up four days. Mm. And I go, you know, you're taking four, uh, you know, I go, you're taking away a third of my, my time. And I raise my hand and I, we're in the meeting and I go, I go, hey, I go, now uh, I'm, I'm imagining that this doesn't count for a normal sales contest because it's only 10 days, right? Like, and he goes, no, nope, this, it is what it is. This you got to yeah. work with the time allotted. And I already was having such a difficulty trying to get my, wrap my head around this thing had never been done in 14 days, right? And now I'm cut down to 10. And so my first thought is, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I got to wait till the next one to try it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm driving home and I remembered something that one of my mentors taught me. He said the purpose of a goal, and I think this is a Jim Rohn philosophy actually. Mm -hmm. He said the purpose of a goal isn't to hit the goal. It's to become the type of person that could hit the goal through mm -hmm. your, the way you approach it. And so I thought, hmm, what if I just gave it everything I had for 10 days yeah. and I wasn't attached to the result. Yeah. And I made my number one goal on who could I become in those 10 days or who would I need to be? And so then I started reverse engineering it that night as I'm laying there in bed, starting to fall asleep. I go, okay, let's fast forward 10 days from now. If I were to have done it, what would have had to happen? And I thought, all right, well, there's, there's two categories here. There's a mindset piece. How am I gonna think about this? How am I gonna approach this for these 10 days? And then there's, a, there's an actual logistic piece. What am I gonna do for the 10 days? What's my schedule gonna be like? And so I determined, well, the mindset, I've gotta, I've gotta maintain unwavering faith until the last moment yeah. that it's possible. I go, cause let's say for example, you've only got one day left and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm eight grand behind. Well, it's not possible if I decide, well, there's no way I can do it. I'm, I'm 8,000 away and I've got a day. That's, mm. not, a, that's not possible. Mm. Then, yeah, it's not possible. I said, so the only way, and I started calling it a miracle because I go, the only way I could pull this miracle off would be if even going into that last day, I go, all right, I don't know how, but I'm going to sell $8,000 today, right? Like, I don't know. 
And so number one, the first decision is I've got to maintain unwavering faith until the last possible moment that I can do this. Yeah. And I'm doing that through my self-talk. Mm-hmm. I can do this no matter what, there's no other option. The second thing, in generic terms, I thought I've got to put forth extraordinary effort. I've got to give it everything I have until yeah. the last possible moment. Mm. And so I went out and here's some quick math, right? So I needed to average $2,000 a day to sell 20 grand in 10 days, right? Um, that meant the first week I needed to sell 14,000. Mm. At the end of the week, I was at 7,000. So I was halfway where I needed to be. I went and turned in my orders. And now I was feeling scared, nervous, right? All the natural human emotions. I go, I'm $13,000 away and I've got three days. Mm. That's next to impossible, right? Especially when I've given it everything I had for seven days and sold seven grand. So how is everything I have gonna sell 13,000 in three days? And I went to my manager and I turned in my orders and he goes, how, where, you know, he knew what I was going for. He goes, where are you at? It's like, he goes, you had 14,000, you, 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 you on track, you close? And I said, not even close, his name was Frank. I said, I'm at 7,000. And he said, okay, he said, that, that, you know, you're, that go, if I were you, just set the goal to 10,000, that's still a great, called a push period. He said, that's still a great push period. You can go for the record next time. I said, oh, Frank, I don't think I explained this to you. <laughs> I'm going to sell $20,000, 13,000 more in the next three days, no matter what, there is no other option. Now, Mo, here's a very important part. Did I fully believe that? Absolutely not. Mm. Absolutely. How, how, could it, how could anyone? No. Right? Like if you had said, hey, I want you to bet your life on it, I'd go, no, the odds are not in my favor. Yeah. The odds are slim to, n- I know the odds. I play with numbers. I'm in sales. I run the, you know, I know my average order. I know my closing percentage. But this was almost like a spiritual approach. Yeah. Where, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of testing the magic, you know. And so I go out the next three days, I sell $10,000. And I mean, and it was like miracle. You know, the first week I was struggling. This week, boom, boom, boom. This, this order, this order, this order. This person is ordering double. I mean, everything. It's going right. And I'm at $17,000. And the next morning, I'm supposed to meet at the office at 8 a.m. to drive to the sales conference. You know, I'm 21 years old. And... um I go, I committed to put forth extraordinary effort to the last possible minute. So I called my manager. I said, hey, I'm at $17,000. I'm $3,000 away. I, if you'll let me miss the t- group meeting in the morning, and I was a leader, so it was important that I was there normally. I said, I could squeeze two appointments in, in the morning and then drive to the conference and meet y'all there. Mm-hmm. And he said, Hal, normally, you know, you're a team player. I would say no, but I, I, I know how, how hard you're working towards this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a pass. Go for it. So I schedule two appointments for the next morning. I'm nervous. I drive to the first one and I'm going, okay. And I'm, it's what I call my miracle mantra. It's simply saying, I'm going to blank no matter what, there's no other option. Mm-hmm. Real simple. That's the formula. I'm going to sell $20,000 no matter what, there's no other option. I drive to first appointment, fired up. Um, I got to do it. Knock on the door. She's not there. Aww. Nobody answers. And I'm going, no, no, no. And I, I call. She's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot. I'm so sorry. I'm across town. I, 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 I can't make it back. And my heart just sinks. And I'm like, oh, come on, man. I was, I'm so close. I'm so close. So I'm driving my last appointment and I'm going, okay, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to sell. Because th- our biggest set at the time was $1,500. Yeah. So to sell $3,000 is it's pretty, yeah. it's like, I don't know how to do it, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm driving there and I'm going, okay, I don't know how, but I'm going to sell $3,000 somehow, no matter what, there's another option. And wait to, wait to see how this story gets just crazy. So I draw, I knock on the woman's door and the woman that answers the door has a very heavy European accent, mm. which was not the woman that I set the appointment with. So I go, oh, is, is, you know, Mary here? She said, oh no, she is uh, gone for the day. And uh, I said, no, 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 <laughs> no. I, I had an appointment with, are you sure? Can you call her? Can you tell, you know, and she's like, no, she went to, they went there, you know, they're three hours away. Oh no, I'm just, you know, I'm like, you know, it's, it's about to come crashing down. And she goes, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, so who are you? She said, oh, I'm her sister-in-law. I, mean, I flew in for my brother's 50th birthday party this weekend. Oh. And I said, and she goes, anything I can do to help you? And my first thought is, no, she's on vacation 
from Europe, mm -hmm. she's not going to buy $3,000 of knives, right? Like, <laughs> and so I go, no, thank you. And then this little voice in my head, the voice, my voice that I had said for the entire two weeks, I'm committed. I'm going to I'm sell $20,000 no matter what. There's no other option. I'm doing everything in my power till the last possible moment. That moment hasn't quite arrived. I got, a, I got about an hour and a half left. I said, oh, actually, ma'am, if you wouldn't mind, if I could just do my presentation for you, I would really appreciate it. And she goes, sure, come on in. Mm. Tell me this is not a miracle, Mo. I, I'm talking to her and I find out, she says, this is so interesting that you're showing me knives. I've never heard of Cutco, but my husband and I, a week ago, before we came to America, were looking at Hinkle's German knives. We need a new set of knives. And we decided we'd wait till we got back from America to go buy them. Interesting. And... My brother-in-law's 50th birthday party is this weekend. We've been racking our brain to find him a gift. Uh -huh. And Mo, can you guess what his passion was? Knives. Cooking. Cooking, yeah. So she buys two ultimate sets. There you go. $3,017 order. And I, I get over $20,000, you know, something. And I drive to the conference and I'm number one and I, and I break the record. And that became the miracle equation. And... I, and again, this was 22 years ago. I started teaching it to my colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, hey, I'm, in fact, this girl came. She goes, hey, can you help me do what you did? I said, yes, unwavering faith, extraordinary effort. Here's how to apply it. Create this mantra, this affirmation, manage your mindset. But, you know, and, um, and in miraculous fashion, the last day of her two-week period, she sold $5,000 the last day to get over 20,000. And then I started teaching and repeating. And, and then I started thinking, I, I backed up and I went, okay, outside of my little Cutco sales bubble, I started looking at the world's most successful people. And you think about this, the world's most successful people, the biggest innovators, they had to maintain unwavering faith that something could be done that had never been done before. Mm -hmm. And they had to put forth extraordinary effort until it was done. And that is how remarkable, extraordinary accomplishments are come to pass. But, and you think about the world's best athletes. Think about, I think like Michael Jordan. When I was a kid, it was Michael Jordan. And you think about the average human being allows the outer world to determine the inner world. Things aren't going, I'm not on track for my goal. So then they let self-doubt overtake them versus choosing unwavering faith. Yeah. You know, but Michael Jordan says, I know I, I've missed 13 shots this game, but I want the ball again. I'm not unwavering faith. I'll make every shot I take. Michael, you missed that one. Okay, but I'll make the next one. You missed that one. You keep saying it to me, it's the mindset of a champion. Absolutely. And then, and that's where you see these, the Michael Jordan, the Kobe Bryant, you see they have the first three quarters of the game. They can't make a shot to save their life. Mm. And in the fourth quarter, their Eight. mindset is I have unwavering faith and I'm going to perform the extraordinary effort till that buzzer rings. Yeah. And then you see them create this miracle where they come alive and they come back from behind and they win the game because they maintain unwavering faith that they could and they put forth extraordinary effort until that they did. It's honestly honestly the only way anything extraordinary has ever happened honestly it, it, it's just yeah, it's the yeah. most fundamental yeah i mean and, and when you really when you really uh, when, while you're talking about i'm looking back at my own life where i had a few miracles as well and mm -hmm. you know and they're all exactly the same way i have this very weird mindset where i just simply tell myself look it's gonna be eight hours for some until something happens yeah. just put your heart in it for eight hours what's wrong with you right if you're here and you're at work and you know just do it yeah. uh, and and it makes all the difference in the world it's just uh, really um it sounds simple when you explain it but it is the biggest difference between big achievers and those who don't yeah. big achievers start by actually believing that they can do it because yeah. if you don't, you're never going to do anything yeah. about it. Yeah. And then they do it, right? They do the best they can. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to come close yeah. and miss it. But you're going to be much, much higher than you would have been if you didn't actually put your mind to it and put, and put your best effort. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. even if you, you know, and maybe you're meant to not reach. It goes back to that Jim Rohn quote. Yeah. You know, you think about, let's imagine someone, let's say they're both going for a goal. We'll, I'll go back to the Cutco example. Yeah. Let's say on day one, you know, uh, one one sales rep meets a billionaire and they buy their entire way to the goal 
And then that person that that person takes the next 14 days off, right? And they go, oh, yeah. I did it. Yeah. Let's say the person number two struggles. They give it everything they have. They encounter disappointment and ch- the other person's at home watching TV, whatever. And this person's struggling their way and they get close, but they don't hit their goal. But they give it everything they have and they overcome challenges, right? And they grow and they evolve and they don't hit the goal. From the outside looking in, everybody go, wow, person number one won. They're the winner. They're the, they they, they hit their not. goal and yeah. they did it. And what an amazing, one person bought it and you took the rest off. You are lucky. Mm. That person didn't grow. They Absolutely. didn't learn. Yeah. They did not become any better. Which is and really in the, the long run, of life, the honestly. bigger benefit yeah. was the person that sold less, that missed their goal, Absolutely. but that grew yeah. and became that better version of themselves. And they can take that version of themselves where the other person stayed the same into everything else they do for the rest of their life. Cannot agree more. I, I actually think the biggest benefit of every challenge we've ever taken is to learn, is to develop, is to become your, you know, closer to your potential. It's not to achieve a target. It's not to, you know, uh, go on that date and just impress her. It's no. to actually understand what you want in a relationship. It's not to, you know, to close a big deal and then get your commission. It's to learn how to close a big deal. I think that's absolutely true. Honestly, I can talk to you for 16 more hours, but normally on episodes like this where, where it's just littered with gold nuggets, I would, I would actually say stop and ask our listeners to watch it again. Mm. Okay, so instead of us talking for two hours, I would actually say, hey, to put the next hour to listen to this again. So I'll, I'll close with my uh, closing question every time. You seem to have given a lot of thought uh, to, to things that you, um, you know, that make you who you are. What's your secret to happiness? Hmm. I think my secret to happiness is choosing it unconditionally. Mm. Um, it's not putting happiness in anything outside of myself. Mm. It, you know, there's that old f- saying that, you know, there's no way to happiness. Happiness is the way it, it really goes to, I want to be happy and I will not allow anything outside of myself to deter or determine my happiness or mm-hmm. my emotional well mm. Um, so that's, that's the first and that's the foundational secret is waking up every day and going, how do I want to feel today? Yeah. I want to be happy. I want to be excited. I want to be, and then getting into that state. Yeah. In fact, I do something I call my emotional optimization meditation, mm. where when I identify that state, I get in it and then I'll set my timer and I'll just sit and try to go as deep and, 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 and just intense into that state of joy, happiness, gratitude, whatever it is. And that way I'm programming my nervous system to be able to acclimate to that any time I want, making it easier and easier to be happy. Mm. That's the inner piece. But the outer piece is to do things that make happy, being happy easier, right? Mm. Um, little things, for example, the miracle morning is that to me is every morning, that's that's my happy time. Yeah. That's, nothing can affect that. Nothing, mm. that, that is me just optimizing myself. Connecting to you. Connecting to me, to source, to, yeah, just, just me becoming and being the best version of myself, totally at peace, mm. totally joyful, totally happy. Um, it comes to really selflessly adding value for other people. Oh. And I think that I th- that I defined that was my purpose when I was 25. I read a book called Love is the Killer App by <laughs> Tim Sanders, mm. the former CEO. I love that. Yeah. 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 And, um, and from that book, I, d- I defined my purpose in life is to add, first it was to add value for other people. Cause that's really what the theme of that book was. Like the more value you add, the more people want to reciprocate and everybody wins, right? Yeah. And so I thought my purpose in life is to add value for other people. And what happened was I would catch myself doing it only when it was convenient for me. Mm. And so then I decided to add the word selflessly add value because I went, my pur- I want my purpose to be pure. Yeah. I want to add value even if I don't feel like it, even if I'm tired. And interestingly enough, you find that when you add value for someone else and they light up, you get that energy, totally. right? And so I remember when this purpose was solidified, I was working towards my biggest Cutco goal. I was 25, it was my last year with the company. And um, I was leading a team of my colleagues because in order to make my goal that year of having my best year ever meaningful, 
I thought it, it doesn't matter if it's only for me. I've got to help other people reach their full potential too. And I had a friend who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Mm. And he, um, he, he just kind of went off the deep end and he got arrested on cocaine driving 100 miles an hour on the freeway. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of people had kind of written him off. Mm. Um, and when I had talked to him in recent times, he drained my energy. He drained my energy. And, and so I started avoiding his calls. I just, mm. I, just couldn't, I just couldn't take it. And literally the morning I had added that word selflessly adding value Aww. into my life, I was driving to my first appointment and he called and I picked up the phone and I set it back down. And then my own voice again, Hal, your, your purpose in life is to selflessly add value to the lives of every person you possibly can. He's calling you right now because he obviously wants needs to you. talk yeah. to you. He needs you. It's not about you. And that became my mantra. It's still to this day. It's not about you. Yeah. Like, do I put my auction mask on first? Absolutely. Am I striving for my own goals? Absolutely. But there's this, it's again, holding two opposing ideas at the same time. It's not about me. My marriage, it's not about me. And from that place of serving my wife selflessly, my, my life's awesome. My marriage is the best it's ever been, right? Because I'm focused on giving to her. So I pick up the phone and I'm um, like, I take a deep breath, like, here we go. <laughs> this is going to drain me, but I'm doing it for him. He needs me. And so I talk to him. And we talk the whole way to my appointment for about 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, he shares with me how much he's struggling, but he's doing better. He's, 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 he's made some, some, some turns, but he's really struggling. He's really struggling mentally and emotionally. And um, I give him some advice and I share some thoughts and some encouragement just from a place of love. And he says, Hal, you have no idea what this call meant to me today. No uh -huh. idea. And I got a phone and... You know, I kind of looked out. I was like, "This is it. This is like this is good. This, is this my, feels this is, good. This, this yeah. feels right. This is yeah. this was my test to live my purpose. I did, and he just it served him. But here's what I didn't know. Mm. Years later, I hosted my first ever live event, and I had recently reconnected with him. And he was struggling financially, but he was doing much better. He was in a really positive place. He was working as a personal trainer. He'd gotten his, physically, he had gained all this weight. He was lost it now. He's back in shape. He's doing great." And uh, I said, hey, I'm having a live event. I want, I want to, you can come for free. Like I'll, you know, I'll cover the ticket, but I, I felt yeah. like it would help him. And he catches me in the lobby um, on the first day of the event. And he said, Hal, I just, he gave me a big hug. You know, he said, brother, I love you. Thank you for, I need this. And he said, I want to share something that he said, I'm sure you won't remember this. He said, like five years ago, or how many years ago, I called you. He said, I was suicidal. I know. And I was thinking of taking my life that day. Yeah. And he said, um, you were the most positive person I knew. So I reached out to you and he said, if you wouldn't have answered my call, I, I don't know if I'd be alive today. And, uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, you know, that, that call saved my life. And he said, you probably don't even remember it. And I said, you have no idea that yeah. call defined my life. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said, you know, and, and, and so we hugged and, and it was like, just wow you know like you know listening to that voice inside learning from other people serving selflessly um living a life on purpose um i don't know if i answered your question but yeah that's it <laughs> i don't think anyone has ever given me a better answer Hal. i'll tell you openly I, I think serving selflessly has been the ultimate answer to my happiness mm -hmm. i think most of us don't actually realize it's not about me it's not about me. It's that's such. I think that changes the world. I think anyone who actually realizes that you could probably save a life if you just for one second stopped selfishly making everything about you. About you? Yeah. My when my son, um, you you know, my I lost my wonderful son when he was twenty one, and uh, and someone walked to me and said. Uh, uh, you know, how could you let the doctor do that to your son? And I said, what do you mean my son? This is, you know, Ali's never been mine. Yeah. yeah Ali's been his. This is his life. Yeah. This is his journey. 
And he, you know, I, I, I am a firm believer that life doesn't end with death. And, and so I basically said, and, and my son is now on his next level of the journey. It's his journey. Yeah. Who am I to say no to his journey? Yeah. And I think the, the idea of us simply saying, look, it's going to be 20 minutes of my, my time. Most people will say, I don't want to take that call. But think about that. If you took that call, it was 20 minutes of your life, but the entire life of someone else. Yeah. And for that, I shall forever call you sensei. <laughs> That's my absolute intention. I really don't know what to tell you, all of you listening. It's, it's just such a joy. It really is such a joy for me to carry my kit with me and travel the world and meet the most incredible humans that there are. Honestly, just because you give me that chance by listening to slow-mo, I have a new friend and a new sensei. And I will have to tell you openly, there is so much of what you said today that, that, you know, that are things I do and I understand, but you, you just said them so well, so well, that I definitely am going to commit to a miracle morning. Mm -hmm. I think everyone absolutely needs to read the book, absolutely needs to look at the, uh, at the work of Hal. And I think it really is a miracle when you think about the fact that being, something, becoming something, truly is what matters most than all that we do. It's not about us. Uh, it's about this whole journey for all of us at the same time. And I uh, think, um, as I always say on episodes like this, I think the best use of your time is to pause, rewind, and listen to this again. It was littered with gold nuggets. Uh, and I think you uh, will agree with that. Share it with people that you love and tell them that they can benefit from this. And um, yeah, when you start your morning tomorrow, slow down a bit and do those six things because honestly and truly, they will change your life. We call them savers. So uh, meditate, which is <laughs> silence. Yeah, silence, affirmations, visualizations, exercise, reading, and uh, scri scribing, which is journaling. Uh, I think those who are truly, truly savers. Uh, Hal, I cannot thank you enough. Honestly, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation, totally worth my trip. And I cannot thank you all uh, enough for giving me the opportunity. Uh, take a little bit of time to slow down and start to do what matters because it doesn't really matter uh, how busy you are today. There's always a tiny bit of, the, of time to, to slow down. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.